My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens 24-7. All right, we have started this year talking about creativity, and we continue with an episode that's going to focus on the nexus of creativity and entrepreneurship, which is a great spot to be in if you can figure out how to make money, which a lot of people struggle with. You think, you know, I have this great idea, I'm so creative, I want to start a business, but then actually monetizing your creative ideas, that is the tricky part. And my guest, Jeffrey Madoff, teaches a class on exactly this subject, which is one of the most popular classes at the Parsons School of Design in New York City. Now, that class is called Creative Careers. I actually had the shot to stop by and talk about my own career a couple years ago. And so that's how I got to know Jeffrey better. And I have been amazed with him because he actually lives sort of his whole ethos. He's a director. He's a photographer. He's a writer. He has a play coming out that he's angling to get to Broadway, which we'll talk about a little bit. And he has written a book called Creative Careers, Making a Living with Your Ideas. And here's what you're going to learn today. You're going to learn how you can actually make money doing something creative. You're going to learn why creative people shouldn't accept the notion that they're just going to starve to death because, you know, that's just not sustainable. And it's why so many people end up quitting the things they love doing because they can't pay the bills. And we're going to talk about how to be creative each and every day, more creative so that you can bring creativity into your life and your career. Now, In terms of a small ask this week, this is a really easy one, and it's a fun one. I want you to tell me about something you're trying to do creatively and monetize. Just send me a note. I want to hear, and maybe I'll share some of these on the show, but I just want to get a sense of what people are doing. So send me a note at letsconnect at patrickmcginnis.com. Find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis or tweet me at PJ McGinnis. I promise you I read them all and I respond. Maybe not the same day, but pretty, pretty closely thereafter. All right, so... As you know, I like to start every conversation with the same question. And of course, I did the same thing with Jeffrey. And so I started our conversation by asking him this simple question. Well, to be honest, not so simple, but I asked him this question. What's the most important decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? The most important decision I made was the decision to move to New York City. And that was a very big decision uh, because I had no connections here. I didn't know anybody here. I had one cousin. And uh, people said to me, I was moving from Madison, Wisconsin, where I went to the University of Wisconsin. And people said, do you have a job lined up? And I said, no. Do you know people there? No. Do you have a place to live yet? No. Well, aren't you afraid of what's going to happen if you move? I said, actually, I'm afraid of what's going to happen if I don't move. Because that, to me, was a known. And moving to New York opened up just this incredible vista of possibility. And now we're talking about 40 some years later. And uh, that was real the real inciting inc- incident in my adult life, moving to New York City. I love it because as you're talking, I can hear the sounds of the city behind you. I think there's a <laughs> jackhammer in there. So I'm thinking to myself, you could have had more peace and quiet back in Wisconsin, but... <laughs> <laughs> you are today. Now, you teach this class at Parsons School of Design that's called Creative Careers. Why are you the right kind of person to be a professor teaching a class like that? Well, considering that I came up with the concept for the class and named it, <laughs> that was a pretty good reason by default, if nothing else. But I've also kind of lived by what I talk about. You know, I started off as a fashion designer. Uh, I've been a college professor for 14 years. I've written a book. Uh, I have a play that's opening in March of 22. So I've always done things uh, with related to creativity, but really about the ideas that seduce me. Uh, and I've been lived by my own credo, which is to try to make a living with my ideas and sort of forge my own way. 
So is that how you define creative career? The idea of living off of your ideas and finding a way to sustainably live by monetizing your talents and ideas? Uh, yeah. I mean, if you want to be an actor, if you want to be a writer, a painter, a dancer or whatever, you know, there's always the question that comes up is, well, what's your fallback position? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to be a dentist or a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant, nobody says, what's your fallback position? You know, that apparently is the fallback position. So I think that, you know, the fallback position, if you consider yourself a creative person, is your own resourcefulness, your own savvy and your own persistence so that you stick with what you're going after. Because it's not easy. It's difficult. And I think the main thing is you have to define what success is for you. And, you know, I mean, I'll ask you the question. Do you think that you could ma be making a lot of money in a job, yet be miserable every day that you work at it? Definitely. I mean, that is, that's the classic trade-off, right? There's the, the people who do, they kind of, you know, do the traditional industries. Like, let's say, I don't want to pick on lawyers, but let's just say lawyers. When you're a lawyer, you know, it's a very stable career, at least it used to be, but it still kind of is. And some people really love the work. I mean, some people get lit, they get lit up by it and they're like, I love drafting and I love maybe if you're doing a particular type of law, but a lot of people do it and they're like, this is not lighting me up every day, but you know what? I'm able to have a lifestyle that makes it worth it for me. And I think then on the flip side, you have the concept of the other extreme, which is the person who's pursuing their passion, but they make no money. And so they're like, you know, the starving artist types. And I think what's interesting about the, the space in which you operate is you're asking people to think beyond those two archetypes and say, like, how do you, through having a plan and thinking beyond this kind of like limited mindset, how can you actually build a creative career where you're able to live comfortably and still do things that are important to you. Is that is that a fair description of your work? Yeah, because it's not binary. You know, there's all kinds of shades in between. There are people that work regularly at what they're doing, uh, and they may not have made some kind of a fortune, but they've made enough to live comfortably. And, you know, when I was younger and embarking on doing the filmmaking, I skipped that one. <laughs> you know, the filmmaking, <laughs> which I've been doing for over 40 years, uh, you know, I think that when I was younger, unmarried and without kids, there were different criteria for my de decisions than when I got older. I had to keep in mind that, you know, I had a lot more living overhead, uh, but that never changed my path. I just figured out, you know, it kind of worked out and I figured out how to do it. And I also think there's this dichotomy also that well, if you're creative, you're no good at business. And if you're good at business, you're not creative. And I don't think that's accurate either. Now, tell me something. You have all these, you know, you you have really remarkable people who come into your class and share their own journeys about how they have built a creative career sustainably. So who are some of the folks that have come into your class and what are the, some of the things that they have said that you found particularly impactful? Wow. I mean, they're, they're, that's sort of like trying to empty the ocean with a teaspoon because I've had so many good people. I had this very uh, smart, sage guy. You may have heard of him, Patrick McGinnis, uh, who did my class. I think he's overrated, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I've had a, a wide range of people, as you know. So, And it's been very different kinds of people. For instance, Roy Wood Jr., who was a uh, correspondent on The Daily Show and a comedian, who, when he talked about the rigors of how he has built his career in comedy, how he has iterated on the product because he gets immediate feedback from the audience as to whether or not something works, where in the uh, at The Daily Show, he's got a writer's room where it's very competitive for whose stuff makes it on the air, but then he has his stand-up career, uh, and that he will, in his earlier days, drive six miles for a small gig because it got him in front of an audience he wanted to be in front of. That was really fascinating. Uh, I had Tim Ferriss. And Tim Ferriss, I think something that he couldn't have anticipated was that he would become the level of celebrity he is and have the impact he had when he did the four-hour work week. And we met just as that was coming out. 
Wow. And, and so to see the mushrooming of his career and building a career, he's another great example of making a living with his ideas, because that's exactly what he does, uh, that that was really, you know, an interesting takeaway, too. Uh, but then I've had people like Alan Miller, who is uh, the founder of the News Literacy Project, a two-time Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, who talked about critical thinking and how to vet for truth uh, when you're looking at whether it's online media, uh, on television, newspapers, how do you apply critical thinking so you know what's true and how to vet for that? Kathy Ireland, who is a global entrepreneur who started off, I had shot Kathy 30 years earlier when she was a model and she had the most Sports Illustrated covers ever. And Kathy was great because her take on business was interesting. She decided they wanted her to start with a line of swimwear because, you know, of her Sports Illustrated background. And she said, no, because I don't want people buying because of my celebrity. I want them buying because of my products. So she started off with socks, about as unsexy a thing as you can think of. And she built a global business uh, through her own savvy and smartness and then some of the painful lessons she learned along the way. FOMO. FOMO. Now, it is interesting because I come from the business world and a lot of your students, you know, they, I can only imagine that they get to school, they're talented. Their parents are like, have probably told them, oh, you know, I, you need to figure out a way to make a living. You know how it is. Like, I remember my brother became a jazz musician and people were sending my parents condolence notes or something. It's completely ridiculous, but, and he's done really well. But, you know, what we do know is that dedicated artists and people who are performers, they still spend a ton of their time on the business side of their careers. I mean, if I guess if you get really big, you're massive and you have like a manager and an agent and all of the stuff, then that's not the case. But like I, one of my friends is a singer and he also works at the coffee shop by me and we've gotten to know each other. And today he was talking about how he he's looking for gigs and all the business stuff he's doing. And, he, you know, we're going to chat about it. And so it's a thing, right? That nowadays you can't just sort of create without thinking about the business parts of that. And yet at the same time, like creative schools and art schools, they don't really teach business. Like, why is that? Well, I think there's been this dichotomy between the two that you're either creative or you're a business person. And that goes to some of the old left, right brain thinking. And that left, right brain thinking is a myth. You know, when it initially, uh, those studies came out by Roger Sperry, who was a neuroscientist, it was before brain imaging was sophisticated. And as a result, uh, you know, the, the bicameral brain became a thing of popular culture. You can still go online and see, are you left brain or are you right brain? And in fact, that doesn't really exist. There's so much crosstalk between the hemispheres of the brain that those ideas are no longer accurate because they never were accurate. But at the time, it seemed to be an apt measurement. But that dichotomy has always uh, existed. There's not anything in terms of making a living that's easy. You know, and I think one of the myths out there is, you know, following a certain recipe for success that somehow manifests itself if you follow those steps. And I call that the myth of replication, because you cannot replicate somebody else's life and circumstances because there are so many variables. It's an entire ecosystem psychologically, economically and otherwise. And so I think that, you know, that division is based on some untruths that are very, very old. And we have to look at the world differently now. It's so true what you say. And I think about right now with the changes in the last year and a half where so many people in creative arts, they couldn't do what they're supposed to do. They weren't able to do their job because they, you know, they couldn't perform. And some of these still, these things linger today where, you know, there's, there's still like barely any live performances happening. And some of those people just went on TikTok and, you know, they became massively famous. I have a friend who's an actor who is now a TikTok superstar and it's opened a million doors for him and he's on TV and he's here and there. And it's like, you know, being resourceful isn't just for the entrepreneurs, it's for everybody. And these days, because of all the tools that we have at our disposal, you can do things without leaving your house if you're smart enough to figure out how to do it. 
and you stick with it that just may work. Now, they may not work, but that entrepreneurial mindset, like if you're a classical musician and you didn't find a way to teach online or to perform online or to do different things and you just were waiting for the concert hall to open back up, you weren't going to eat for a year and a half. And that is a really bad situation. And, and I would posit, by the way, that if you are a comedian, if you are a, magi- a musician or a magician, uh, you are an entrepreneur because it's your job that you've defined and you're trying to build a business out of it. And that's what an entrepreneur is. So, you know, oftentimes I aren't looked at in that way. Another guest I had who I just loved talking to her was Eliza Schlesinger. And Eliza is a comedian. She's also a producer, a writer. She uh, recently wrote uh, and produced a feature film, uh, which is her f- like fourth feature, I think. She's really smart about her career. And, you know, she's laying the groundwork to do all these kinds of different things. And she's somebody else that her entire touring schedule, which was quite heavy for 2020, like everybody's, went out the window. But she used that time to work on these other projects, you know, to hone her chops. Like she had shot the movie before the COVID shutdown, and then it was edited and then gotten out there. And so I think you're, you're right. You know, COVID was kind of an accelerant for a lot of people. And it gave them the time to work on things. Some people, just because of the difficulty of it, went into kind of a suspended animation for a while. Uh, And so there's no one answer to that. But I do think all of these different creative careers we're talking about that are the traditional creative careers, well, I think being an entrepreneur is a creative career because it's an idea that starts in your head and then you are trying to actualize it. And that actualizing could be that you're a dancer or a singer or a comedian. So uh, it doesn't mean that you're designing an app or some other kind of thing when you think of entrepreneurs. FOMO. FOMO. Now you have eaten your own cooking, as it were, over the years. But especially now you are, you know, you wrote a play that was supposed to come out, I don't know, (laughs) 18 months ago or something. I mean, you, you're you a great example of this, of having to be resilient. You wrote a play, COVID happens, everything gets delayed and delayed and delayed, but now it's going to happen. So tell us what you've learned. I mean, first of all, anybody who's gotten involved in the play, sort of the theater world is like, it's a, it's not easy, right? It is a, it is a really hard industry. What have you learned in doing this project? And tell us a little bit about when it's going to, you know, come to fruition. COVID imposed a uh, year long delay. So what we did uh, during that period of time, I worked on the script and did a number of iterations on the script. I met with the director, Sheldon Epps, a number of times where we would talk about different story ideas. We met with our set designer, David Gallo, uh, going over different kinds of set ideas. And I said, look, the time's going to go quick. So what we should do is take advantage of this time that we have Because, you know, this additional year and a half that we're waiting, in fact, if we make good use of it, we can be ahead of the game. And so the same thing with my management, my executive producer and general manager, figuring out the financial projections and what we needed to hit in terms of the money raise, looking at what the potential next steps were. So we could have sat idly and just waited for things to seem to be coming back to life. But instead, I wanted to be aggressive and keep moving forward. And part of that is psychological because I didn't want to feel like we were stopped. But the other thing was taking advantage of the time we had to make it better. So we're going to be moving into the theater February 1st of 2022. Uh, we, We are in rehearsals for the month of February. Then we start previews. March 2nd, we have our opening on March 6th and run run through the 27th at People's Light Theater in Malvern, Pennsylvania. And what's the name of the show and what's it about? The show is called Personality, the Lloyd Price Musical. Lloyd Price was an amazing person I had the good fortune of meeting some years ago. And uh, a lot of people don't know his name or who he is, but everybody knows his music. So when you hear, cause you've got walk a personality, talk a personality, and if that doesn't kill your desire to see the play, uh, (laughs) you know, that song was 
phenomenally popular and Stagger Lee and Lottie Miss Claudie. And when Lloyd recorded his first song, which was Lottie Miss Claudie back in 1952, at that time, if you wanted to buy a record from a black artist, you had to go to a black owned record store. It was called race music. Lloyd was the first young recording artist to sell over a million records, which was absolutely unheard of. But the music business used to be an adult business. And nobody is prejudiced against green. So when he was selling that many records, that broke down the wall that was called race music. So from then on, as a result of Lottie Miss Claudie, which has since been covered by the Beatles, by Elvis, by Bruce Springsteen, on and on and on, uh, that broke down that wall called race records. Lloyd was also the first musician of any color uh, to start his own label because music math didn't make any sense to him. You know, why is it that the label gets 97%, I get 3%, I write it, I perform it, all the production costs are taken out of my end. I could sell, I could sell a quarter as many records and make more money. So he was smart. He was an entrepreneur. He started his own label, which then led to Sam Cooke starting his label, Frank Sinatra starting his own label. That wasn't going on before. That was strictly the business side of the business. So he innovated that way. And then he was the first black to open a nightclub below Harlem, the turntable, which was across the street from the Ed Sullivan Theater. And he was on Ed Sullivan many times. And all the musical acts for the Ed Sullivan show, which dominated Sunday nights, you know, when I was a little kid, a phenomenally popular show, they all rehearsed in Lloyd's club. So his story is absolutely amazing. And he died just this past May, May 5th of, of 2021, uh, which was incredibly sad to me because we had become very, very dear friends. And so the added, the added thing that I have taken on myself is creating his legacy because he should be known for the impact he had on popular music and the fact that his life happened at the crossroads of the youth movement, the civil rights movement, and the birth of rock and roll. And it's an incredible story. As I listen to this story, I mean, it's one entrepreneurial thinker, Lloyd was clearly a FOMO sapien. So are you. And, but you're also a, a human being. And I wonder, as, as you do all the things you do, if there's ever stuff that you fear that you're missing out on. You know, I can't say that I fear that I'm other than a good night's sleep, you know, so, <laughs> which I do feel that I'm missing out on. You know, when my kids were little and I was older when I had kids, uh, I never missed, missed my son's track meets. I never missed my daughter being in plays. I never missed a parent-teacher meeting that my wife and I went to. So I think because I had kids when I was older, uh, I had my priorities right. Uh, and so I don't look back with regret you know, about, God, I wish I should have been there more. I should have gone to those things because I fortunately had that consciousness. And I think, again, because it was I, I was older. Uh, so I can't say that I really felt like I missed out because I think you also. A presupposition of thinking that you missed out is somehow not creating your own act activity that's fulfilling and satisfying. And if you're fulfilled and satisfied with what you are doing, then you don't feel like you're missing out on anything because you feel like you're missing out on fun. You might feel like, you know, do I wish I would have bought Apple back in 1986 or so, whenever it was? Sure. Do I wish I would have bought Amazon back then? Damn, I missed out on that fortune I could have made. But on the important levels of fulfillment and personal satisfaction, that's what I've always used as, as my fuel to move forward. So I don't feel I've missed out anything on that level. All right. The book is Creative Careers, Making a Living with Your Ideas. And if you want to check out Jeff's work, you can go to madoffproductions.com. If you want to read more about the book, you can go to acreativecareer.com. Jeffrey Madoff, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Always a pleasure to speak with you, Patrick. Thanks. FOMO. 
Can't get enough of FOMO Sapiens? Join me on Patreon for ad-free episodes, bonus material, and exclusive content that will help you to master FOMO and position yourself for greater success in both business and life. Go to patreon.com slash FOMO Sapiens to learn more. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I love hearing from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstrom. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO.